right, then you get to look at the lodge with us. And it's cute. Because I think when you go in, you might be straight in um, meeting view. She looks like butter or something. Hey, Penny. Hey there. How are you Hi, doing? Penny. So Brody, did you did you get to practice at all? No, so basically my upcoming project though, so I just started a new client project and I'm gonna be using Mast for it. So yeah, yeah so I, that's why I'm really excited for today. Cause I get, to, like, I get to learn a little bit before I start and then I'm gonna be able to like hands-on practice it. So yeah, Love I'm really it. looking forward to it. Excellent. That'd be awesome. Brody, yeah, thanks for coming on, today, Corey. Yeah, are you on man. Twitter or X? Uh, uh, yeah, I am actually. Okay, DM me after if you have questions as you're going along or whatever. Hopefully I can answer some today, but. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. for sure, man. I, I really appreciate that, that's awesome. For sure. It's, it's, it's interesting too, I just, I should find the link. I just saw over the weekend that an agency came out with their own framework and it definitely feels inspired by uh, by Mast, which I am very humbled by, to be honest. Like, uh, is it like that? Uh, the oh, saddle is what they're saddle, called. Saddle, that's it. Yeah, I haven't looked at it. Yeah, oh, and uh, yeah, like even like the branding of it and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> so similar, oh, yeah. but again, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I think it's one of those things. I hopefully clearly make this point in here as people are, you know, later on when I get into it. It's just, I, at the end of the day, we don't, I don't personally care that like people use maths or not, like just use a framework. Like yeah. especially this space is just, you know, people are getting into web dev for the first time, which is incredible. Uh, and it's such a valuable tool to work, you know, more efficiently and all that. But um, yeah. So Penny, do you want to do, like, do you want to start it in and, uh, in like five minutes to let, wait for people to come in or what, how do you want to do this? Um, good question. Uh, I guess we could give it a couple of minutes or we could just sort of chat a little bit. We could, um, is it actually live on YouTube yet or not? I'm just getting the, um, is Jeremy coming uh -uh. back in here or is he running the stream? Oh, wait. I see him right here. Maybe he's still just on mute camera off. <laughs> Is he the no code north north stream? Or yes. no code north stream? Okay. Hey Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> this is all new. Yeah. Just I think... working in the in the corner there of the lab. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know what? if uh, since we have a couple minutes, um, just a favorite. If uh, if some of you are in interested, we're organizing uh, December thirteenth. Actually, I'm going to talk to you about that, Penny and Jeremy. Um, a Christmas party for the community here at the lodge uh, or outside in the snow. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's free. It's and there's going to be a little game of scavenger hunt. And uh, yeah, there'll be more details coming up soon in the next month. Last year's was really fun. Right. It, it, we are live, by the way, just so you know, we are out on YouTube. At this we... Oh, we are live on YouTube. Okay. Well, yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute myself. I'm... Okay. So we're, we're just kind of hanging out a little bit um, just to see if anybody else wants to join us here and gather. Um, and uh, this is the first time that we're streaming here a uh, workshop live out onto YouTube. Normally we are streaming uh, our live stream conversations with Canadian uh, web flow and no code talent. Uh, but today we're starting the beginning of our new uh, workshop series um, and about once a month we'll be hosting folks here in, uh, in Gather to learn about techniques and tools and uh, ways to make your, your work life easier. So I'm Penny Olorensha. Uh We have Maggie here with us, uh, who is another co-founder of No Code North, and Jeremy is in the background, making sure that the streaming all works. And we are thrilled today to introduce our guest today, Corey Moen, who's a staff brand designer at Webflow, but also the 
uh, developer of the MAST framework. And uh, the person who, along with Max Lin, who's also at Webflow, runs No Code Supply Co. So great place to uh, find um, resources and cool stuff that's built in Webflow <laughs> and can be used with Webflow. And let's just get going. Today, uh, before I do that, today, Corey is going to introduce us to the MAST framework. So welcome, Corey. Yo, thank you so much for having me. So stoked y'all are here. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump into it, share my screen. Um, some of this content, if you've seen you know, streams in the past, uh, like I did one with the Minneapolis meetup, uh, similar. And then actually, this is what I think I'm going to end up doing, Benny, just rolling through a lot of like the workshop we did at Chicago Webflow.com. And I'll try to go through it efficiently just to give the TLDR some and the why of MAST and frameworks, and then we'll get into demo. And please, 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 if people have questions, hopefully Jeremy can relay them from YouTube chat as well. Like, please stop me at any point. Uh, Cause I feel like that's usually the best way people get the grasp is, is if they have specific questions as we're kind of going through and showing how it works. So let me share my screen. Um, Y'all see that? Good? Yes. Cool. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Uh, so intro slide here is really just the set setting of how easy it can seem, especially from a marketing perspective, to build in Webflow. You're just dragging stuff around, clicking buttons, binding data, all that. And really it is. But you know, the, the age old thing is that sometimes it's almost too easy. And, and Webflow at the same time is very, very powerful. So it's very helpful to have a system and a process to guide you because at the end of the day, with great power comes great responsibility, like good old Uncle Ben Parker uh, always says. So yes, today we're going to be talking about MAST, which is a CSS framework for Webflow built by NoCode Supply Co. Thank you, Penny, for the intro. Um, on that, uh, we will go through the why, what, and how, and then like I noted, a demo. Um, as Penny said, I am Corey. I'm by day a staff uh, staff brand designer on the web team at Webflow. So we uh, build all things of webflow.com in Webflow. It's very meta. Uh, by the eves and weekends, I freelance as a self-proclaimed Webflow tech lead. So I like to say that I'm you know right now in the middle of design and development. I love code. I love design. Candidly, at any given day, I'd rather be in a code editor or Webflow than Figma. But they're all great. Uh, as Penny also noted, co-founder of No Code Supply Co. Uh, and I am a dad of two precious humans. I have a five-year-old son and one-year-old daughter and eight-year-old pup, uh, who I would call my firstborn. <laughs> uh, and then also, I did this workshop with Max. And so even just noting Max in here as well, Max is my co-founder of No Code Supply Co., fellow Iowan. We are based in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa of the U.S., um, and have been no code fans and nerds for quite a long time. It's also great to note that like no code supply code and then us working on this together has been really great in terms of Max leans more on the like the operator collaborator marketer side of that design dev marketing relationship that we all experience as freelancers or part of an in-house team. And so a lot of the way we thought about it was not solely from a developer's perspective, but also like how can some of this at least be understood based on the marketer side and you know making that flexible as well so jumping right in the why uh so nearly everything that is created and maintained in the world today has two things in common if you think about it system and process um so whether that is you know doing laundry brushing your teeth sending email driving a car of course we're talking today about developing a website well, one of my favorite examples is building a house and the parody here and simply i am a nerd for metaphors and understanding the world through them. And so I like to think about things, especially something like framework, which can be a little intimidating, a little technical if you're just getting into this space. Um, and so this analogy is a great way to break it down. So when you look at these side by side, for example, building a, a house or a website, you're always going to design it. You need to get materials, build it, of course, uh, and then you know inspect it, make sure it's good and quality, and then maintain it in the long run, right? Like nothing's ever done, especially in the web. Uh, and the only difference here is who is doing these roles, right? Or maybe the type of materials, of course, we're using images and fonts on the web, not wood and metal like you would in a house. But the point is that these are consistent and there are parallels and something like building a home, especially in this day and age, is very systematic in most places of the world. 
um, and in, at varying different scales, right? And the reason it's systematic is so that it's efficient and things like that, which we'll get into. So, you know, why do we use these systems and processes? Um, and so the first one, as I just noted, is efficiency, right? Instead of sourcing and building everything from scratch, we use available materials, right? People building a house aren't probably going to go out back and find some trees and chop them down and mill them. No, they're going to go like buy wood from somewhere. Just like on the web, we're not coding in ones and zeros in this day and age. We're using existing languages, frameworks, um, things like that to help us get started and move quicker. Um, and so you even see the analogy here, you know, the wood example, and then especially on the web, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the native languages of browsers and web flow, specifically as we're talking about today. It lets you use, especially the HTML and CSS, um, as it's intended in a visual way in web flow. So it's all the same terminology, functionality, capability that you get from scratch coding just in a much more efficient and visual way, which is hugely powerful without going down the rabbit hole of the benefits of that. That's a whole separate topic, but it's very, very valuable beyond you know, what it might seem on the surface. Um, another one is collaboration. If we have a common way about building something, it makes it so much easier to collaborate with others, right? Whether that's another designer, another developer, again, a marketer, somebody like that, that you're working with via a client or on your team. When there is a documented systematic way that is even you know reduced down to more common language, it makes it much easier to at least like have everybody be on the same page. So in the house analogy, this would be like a blueprint. On the web, this is documentation. So you will see this even outside of the Webflow community and traditional development where you have uh, frameworks that have existed for a long time and the source of them is documentation, explaining how things work, why they work that way, how you modify them, how you extend them, that kind of thing. And then lastly here is consistency. So if you can create something that's repeatable, uh, it allows you to ensure that it's also very high quality while reducing things like human error and cognitive load. So especially those last ones I love to preach about just because like for me, especially like, you know, I, I can only speak from my own experiences, like as I try to build things quicker uh, or larger sites, et cetera, like that, there's a lot going on between communications and requirements and progress tracking and task and time tracking. And so it can be easy to, if you're doing everything from scratch, have like, oops, I forgot to do that thing, or I clicked the wrong button and didn't realize it, that kind of thing. So when you have a system in place, it really helps you just keep a clear focus and have a lot less areas in, or, or errors in the long run, right? So uh, the house analogy here uh, is, is more on the aesthetic side of consistency, but there still rings true that functional side, right? Like people that are building a house are sourcing these things that are pre-made. They're not, you know, hand bending the wire of a basket or something like that. And it, this ensures a bar of quality. Same thing in a, on the web, right? We have a system of buttons and components and things that are that are predefined and you put a lot of focus on that one thing and then you can iterate and scale on different variants of the thing, right? Um, so that's kind of the why behind uh, MAST and frameworks in general. So what is MAST more explicitly? This is our um, really, you know, kind of deep thought elevator pitch that, you know, we feel rounds out the, the what of it pretty well, especially when you break it down. So MAST is a lightweight developer first framework of essential classes and strategies to help you build efficiently for any brand and scale with Webflow. Um, so we're breaking this down, lightweight developer first. What do we mean by that? So the first part is lightweight. Uh, there's a lot of different ways, again, inside or outside of Webflow to build frameworks. Some of them are heavily focused on, uh, you know, we'll have every single pre-built class and pre-built utility you could ever need for any site, which is awesome. And especially if you're building a really massive site, that's probably fine and good, but if you're building simpler sites, then that ends up being a lot of extra code that you won't actually end up using, right? Um, versus uh, something like Mass, the, the way we tried to think about it was let's have like the bare minimum essentials that we know almost any site and any scale would probably use. And this is all based on just really experience. Um, a lot I'll get into this a little bit, but a lot of the mass framework is based on Bootstrap, which is a CSS framework that existed in just traditional development and has been around for 10 plus years. And so I learned on that before ever discovering Webflow as a tool. And I was doing a bit more just scratch front end development. And uh, we, you know, we like a lot of the principles there, but we really reduce them down to just the essentials and then have 
a system in place that if you need to add more utilities or more scale, you can do it and just follow that same approach. Uh, in comparison, some other ones in the space, uh, like Knockout, for example, you can see the chart here. The, the, the idea here is that like Knockout is a still great framework and it has a lot of pre-built sizes. So if you're building a one-page site with Knockout, like honestly, it's pretty massive for that use case. But since there's so many pre-built things, you don't have to add a lot of custom classes. So as the site gets really big, it will actually be more efficient in the long run. Like you can imagine even mass will be heavier eventually. Others like client first, same exact size, ironically, as mass at, at when you just first clone it. Uh, however, client first does not have a layout system. So uh, every single layout and section ends up being a custom class specific to that. And honestly, for beginners, I would suggest it. Like it's great because it's a great way to like kind of compartmentalize sections and, and, and not over complicate CSS reusability, et cetera. But the issue is once you have really, really big sites, especially then, you know, that amount of CSS you're creating because every new section, every new component is custom classes. You can kind of imagine how that just becomes exponential and gets harder and harder to manage. So again, the theory here of MAST is that like it's one approach that you can feel confident using for any scale of a website, whether it needs to stay really lightweight and small or scale up and still use some custom classes, but have as much reusability as you can. So then the other side of the first statement of, again, sorry to jump back, is developer first, right? The thinking here is that, you know, client first on one end is in, incredible, again, for beginners or even the focus in it being client first is that classes are all fully spelled out. It's testimonial list, right? It's very clear. Uh, and, and then the other end of the spectrum is something like Knockout or honestly a better example here is like if you've heard of uh, Tailwind as a framework in traditional development. Um, it's one to look up if, if you're interested and all of the classes are abbreviated and you need, really need to understand what they mean. Right. And so knockout is still a little bit more spelled out, but the point is that like, you need to know how to combine all these things. Like you wouldn't use this vertical one without the flex one, for example. So you need to have that like really developer oriented knowledge to know how to combine and use these things. Whereas mast, we try to carve right down the middle. Again, this is just out of preference and experience of what we feel is most efficient. And so columns, for example, are abbreviated to call, and then LG MD references the breakpoint that, that you're making a modification on. Whereas like something like a card might still literally be called card, and then you, know, you can still use something like a full written testimonial to denote that this is a combo class, which is what CC stands for, um, of the card, right? And so again, we'll show a little more of those in detail and what each of those things mean, et cetera, going on. The next part of the statement is essential classes and strategies. So I kind of noted on this, but really the point is just that it is essential. It's the bare, bare minimum. So you think again about, I want one approach that I can use at any scale. And so even if I'm building a one page lander for a local business or something like that, I know that I just still have a really lightweight, efficient uh, way out of the box without worrying about all the bloat of all these other utilities and things that I may never, ever use on that, on that site. You know, and then on the flip side, knowing that I have a consistent approach like the U dash prefixing and things like that um, to go about it. So that's really the thinking there. And then the other side of this is the strategies, essential classes and strategies. And so this is probably one of the things that we get questions or, or, or comments about the most with MAST is the layout system. And so there, this means there is a really common repeatable way to build layouts, mostly columns and, and alignments and, and, you know, uh, centering things in the middle, those kinds of things. And it's, it's, again, this is almost one for one from bootstrap. In fact, there's, there's somebody named Kevin, uh, I always, it's like cool that actually built, rebuilt the bootstrap layout system in Webflow in 2017. Uh, and so if anybody knows him by chance, please send him my way. I would love to thank him, uh, because I've used that clonable since then. And, uh, and it's now just part of mass. So again, we didn't just think this up. This is a layout system that's very tried and true from bootstrap that has evolved within their own framework for years. So we will get into this, especially in the demo and showing how that works. Uh, and the last part here is building efficiently for any brand and scale. Okay. So the other part of mass here is, uh, again, just out of experience using it. I've used it both in-house and as a freelancer with agencies, a lot of which I would say the most evolution it's seen is through um, uh, agency or studio called ShapeMaker that I've been a part of for almost four years now um, on the side. And we have built 
I mean, I, I don't know that it's over 100. It's definitely, you know, many, many, many 50, 60, 70, 80 sites uh, for a wide variety of clients over the years. And ShapeMaker explicitly, too, also does brand and strategy. So everything we do is very, very custom, bespoke, built for that client and that brand. So rarely are we following a consistent template. And so the framework really need to be flexible within that. And so these are just some screens showing, you know, various different sites that are using the same framework. And then you can also even go to, I'm going to jump off the thing here. Um, if you go to nocodesupply.co slash mass, the mass landing page, if you scroll down, there's actually this mass made section that shows a lot of these that are like just duplicates of the real client project I made and then clean them up for privacy purposes, but you can actually open them in Webflow. And then the only note is these were all also before mass ever had a name. So it's all the same approach with just some slight differences. Even the style guide looks a little different, right? Just because uh, we, Max and I really try to create a brand and efficiency and consistency as we formalize this into being mass as it is today. So I can preach all day. You know, of course I'm biased though. This is just my own preference of way of working. Uh, but, you know, don't take it for us. There's a lot of people that have now started using mast, loving it, especially I would say the most common thing we've seen is people that had their own way of building previously that, you know, wasn't necessarily a documented external framework. And it ironically was very similar to mast most often because something like bootstrap was so popular. So if anybody had had some exposure to front end development in the last 10 years, they've probably come across bootstrap already. And so this feels very familiar for them. And then the other side of it is people just find it very efficient. Something on our, our landing page that, that I really, I think, you know, rings true is this concept of create versus copy. Um, I really struggled before Finding Webflow, especially with tools like WordPress and most of the rest of web, build, web builders on the web are all oriented around templates and themes. And so you have to, instead of, you know, creating a website in this mindset of I'm going to, you know, start from the content and the client brand, and I'm going to build a website from that. It's always the, it's always been the opposite. Instead, I'm going to find a template or a theme, and then I'm going to rig roll, modify it to fit into the shoe hole of the client. And so it's always felt like this, you know, uh, square peg in a round hole concept. And so something like a framework like mass, what I love is I can still build anything with this approach and, and it's from the blank sheet up, not from the template down, if that makes sense. Uh, sorry, I forgot that auto plays. And then one of our favorite ones, hopefully the audio comes through here is from Grace Walker. If you've been in, especially the Twitter community around Webflow, She's very prominent and and has loved it since. So her words say it well. We're not actually hearing. Okay. Cool. What she's saying. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, I don't know if this is coming through. Uh, I can I can post the link too. I mean, you can also see it there. It was on the Dive Twitter channel. So thank you, Penny. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing here is Mass is one of many options. Hopefully that's come through by now. Again, at the end of the day, our thing is not that Mass is the best and the only way. Absolutely not. It is just one of many ways. Things like Client First that are also very popular, Knockout, are also incredible frameworks. And I really think a lot of frameworks is a personal preference thing. It's the way you think. It's the type of clients you work with, the type of team you're on. Um, an example is even on the brand team on Webflow that I'm on. Uh, we have our own internal framework called Boilerplate that I help create. And there's a lot of similarities to Mass uh, and even things we learned from that that then I brought back into Mass. But the reason that we don't A, make it public and B, you know, it is its own thing is because it's for a very explicit brand you know it has our font and all these and colors and like it's it's for that and so oftentimes teams in, on in-house teams especially you know they, they maybe start from something that's existing but modify it for their own use case because they're it's it's a very different context than as a freelancer building you know any site that comes your way kind of thing, right so again just wanted to note that so last thing here what's next for mast uh we have a lot of ideas and things Variable support, uh, we want to you know, update the style guide that we will get into to have more use of variables. So if you do want to modify things, 
from the start, which is encouraged, then it's much quicker to do so. Uh, Figma to Webflow Starter Kit. This is another one we're excited about. There's actually somebody in the community that was already working on uh, rebuilding the style guide solely in Figma. Uh, that will help you, you know, have a little bit quicker jumpstart and visual consistency, you know, from designing things in Figma and then translating them into Webflow. Uh, part of this as well is uh, the Figma to Webflow plugin. If anybody has or hasn't used that, it is a way that you can copy and paste layouts from Figma directly to Webflow. Candidly, I don't use it super often, uh, but a feature in it that's very exciting uh, that often isn't as well known is that you can actually set up layouts in Figma. And then when you paste them into Webflow, you can use command shift S to choose to use the existing classes in Webflow instead of creating new classes. And the point being, if you if you pair that with MAST uh, or any framework, especially that as a layout system, it means that you can almost one for one, you know, build your layouts in Figma or design them using auto layout. And then when you paste them in a Webflow, it will use that existing framework. So you're not generating a bunch of new classes that are then harder to maintain in the long run, right? So hopefully some exciting stuff come in there. Other things in mind is Reloom Component Library. Uh, you know, offering some other ways that you can have some pre-built custom components. But candidly, this may be even a question some of you have is like, can I use Reloom? Like, honestly, yeah. Like, aside from especially the layout part that we will show in the demo that, you know, Reloom is all based on client first for the most part. Aside from that, like the naming, class naming and stuff uh, isn't all that different. It's all ultimately like based on BEM, you know, which is referred to as an acronym for block element modifier. Google that as well. If you Google CSS BEM, lots of great content around just how to name classes for consistency there. But the point being, you know, there is overlap. Um, so if anybody has further questions, they're happy to, happy to talk about it. Other things is themes, uh, you know, offering a way that you can actually have like, if you don't have a pre-existing brand for a site you need to build, having some pre-built themes that are in a larger variety of styles, you know, like one, one having a Sarah font versus a Sans, whatever. Uh, is interesting to us. And then more like clonables, uh, like the docs itself. Like we're thinking it could be interesting to let the whole docs uh, page be clonable. So if you want to modify it and extend it for your specific client, you could do that, especially for, again, if your client has like an in-house team or something. So that is the why and what. Uh, I hope that was all kind of resonating, making sense. Again, please, as we get into the demo, uh, let us know any questions, any questions. Uh, and in the meantime, let's let's jump into the demo. So um, I'll start by saying again, if you want to, you know, learn more and get into MAST, uh, nocodesupply.co slash MAST uh, is where you can find that. If you also just Google no code supply co and go up in the menu here, we have a link to it right there. On this page, you'll find CTAs for reading the docs, which is a separate page here, um, as well as cloning the styles. So if you happen to be new to Webflow, uh, in general, this is a great way to create uh, shareable resources with Webflows that you can make any Webflow project clonable on the Webflow, made in Webflow <laughs> marketplace. Um, and, and then this is also the way that all of these pre-existing classes and styles that make up the framework can exist so that you can use them to start with, right? So you just go here, click clone and Webflow, and then start modifying the style guide for your brand and site, and then build with it from there. Uh, we also have some, you know, a little bit of marketing play here on kind of the, the TLDR of why we, we think about mass and, and or the way we think about mass and why we feel it's great. Uh, there is a stream here similar to this content and honestly, maybe even update this one uh, to be here. Just kind of walking through this again uh, if you want to walk through it later. I already noted mass made. Check out some sites that are built with mast and then re-CTAs at the bottom here. So if we start even as a quick overview on the docs. Um, again, trying to hit the gamut here of where everybody's coming from and familiarity with the web. You know, docs is a great way of just understanding how something works, explaining things, having step-by-step -step guides. For example, we walk through how to start a new project or how to also add mass to an existing project if you're going to refactor it. Um, and especially in here, there's some very specific steps like this where you need to pull and copy in all the styles uh, of mass, all the classes of mass in a very specific order. So they override each other as expected. Um, we also go through typography, uh, how to design for mass. This is another common question. Uh, even as we start the demo here, this is, this is a great way to start. That honestly, like, there isn't a really, really explicit and, and, and hard guidelined way to do it. I would say the most 
Uh, helpful thing to note is if I even look at an example, I mean, honestly, a real client site, this is the shape maker team one. Uh, the, the main thing is that since the layout system, like we will show here in a moment is based on a 12 column grid or guide, then in Figma or your design tool of choice, setting up these, you can see, I can turn them on and off these 12 column guides that match mast is hugely valuable. Uh, and then from there, it's really just thinking in this, this mindset of the way the web works, where you have sections of content, each section can have columns of, of layout. And you can see that it's not necessarily hard bound to every single element needs to be in a column, but in general, you know, having a guide for those things that, that all follow that layout. Like you can see this one here is even centered, but it's centered within eight out of the 12 columns, right? Um, so that, yeah, that is really the main, the main tip on designing for that. We note it here. We also note things about like asset prep and spacing, a lot of spacing in mast uses, uh, units of the web, which are M and REM, uh, and for various reasons, uh, I, again, you know, a lot of it's around experience and strategy and what we think is most efficient, but this can also be a, a place that trips people up just because a lot of design tools don't use those units. It's all just pixel you know, or maybe the REM equivalent. And so, especially if you are primarily a developer only and work with somebody that's designing otherwise, then sometimes there can be this odd expectation of like, oh, well, you know, I need exactly X amount of space between these two things. If I go into developer mode here and, you know, I need 32 pixels exactly, right? And so in this case, this ironically is two REM, but the point is that like the the way mass works is isn't, uh, set on those really hard figures like that. Instead, it's leveraging units that are more scalable. Uh, and so there has to always be some grace between development and design, knowing that like it will be built in an efficient way that is as consistent as possible to design without the expectation of pixel perfection, because that expectation is honestly, no matter how you build it, is it's a little bit uh, impractical, unrealistic, if I'm honest. Uh, no matter, again, if you're working with a full stack engineering team, building a you know, the next Instagram or you're building, you know, a coffee shop website, like that expectation, just the way the web is fluid and responsive and works is sometimes just a really uh, awkward one to get around. Um, so yeah, can deep, deep into that more if, if y'all are curious, but the next major section of the docs here is the fundamentals. So the really, as it kind of, you'd imagine, it's going through the mindset, thinking behind mast, uh, how classes are identified, like kind of like how we think about them as different types of classes. So base classes, utility classes, custom classes, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll show a little bit of using those in combination in the build. Uh, nomenclature, again, this is all based on BEM, uh, which is really common in front-end development. Um, and again, consistent with things like client first, where you're using all lowercase letters or numbers and then dashes and underscores with some small exceptions like this paragraph one here where it does use a period, uh, again, happy to explain more there. We actually note it here. Uh, but, you know, every rule has an exception is one of those things. And, and so we try to, you know, round it out as best we could, but recognize that, like, not everything is going to fit in that perfect world hard and fast, right? Um, other prefixing, this is general rules on class management, like not using too many utilities in combination, uh, when to, you know, combine custom classes and utilities or not, uh, that kind of stuff. We also have some general stuff that's not necessarily specific to MAST. It's more specific about just like how to build well in Webflow, uh, including things like, you know, naming interactions or where to put custom code. Um, we really wanted to use MAST as this like vessel of just also communicating those things. Uh, so it's, yeah, a good way to think about it. And then the style section here gets into all of essentially a breakdown of the, the styles that you will find in mass when you clone the style guide right here, right? So the thinking behind them, why things are set the way they are, including like the out of the box sizing of things like this. So here's all the heading sizes. You'll note that we only have one through four uh, and not one through six, like you would typically get on the web. And again, that's for a reason, like a lot of mass we feel is opinionated um, for a reason. And so even the example here, uh, is that, you know, we, I feel, especially as a designer, uh, less is more, uh, not only aesthetically, but when you have less options of things like heading sizes, it actually forces you to have more contrast between the sizes, which can lead to a better design and also like more consistent design because you're not like 
fumbling between is this an H4 or an H5 in this instance, that kind of thing. But again, as I already said before, this doesn't mean that you can only ever use up to H4 with mass. If you have a client that has a pre-existing system that goes to H6, you can just add that to the style guide and you follow the same approach. Uh, and so it's very still very scalable in that way, right? So we also break down all the different utility classes, what they mean, how to use them, sizes, that kind of stuff as well. Um, a lot of these are pretty straightforward. They have one CSS property or one style property applied to them. Like I want to apply 100% width to this div. Cool, add this utility to it, right? We also have some helper ones that are a com combination of properties, but we feel these are ones that are that should be used on pretty much any website, or we have used them consistently on a, almost every website. Great example of this is like USR only. This means uh, screen reader only. So this is a way to visually hide some text, but not set it to display none, so that if somebody is using a screen reader to read your website, they will still have that text read out to them. But maybe you don't want it visually shown for one reason or another for the design aesthetic. So accessibility is another big thing we keep in mind with something like mask. Uh, last in here again is the layout section. One other thing we've gotten questions around is you know the way sections are built, which is just a sec you know a, a section element or even just a div that has the class of section applied, and then the next div within that is uh, has the the class of container applied to contain the content within it. Uh, opposed to something like client first that has like four, I think elements to create that same general base layout. Uh, and honestly, again, this one's just out of best practice and, and bootstrap and then the layout system or what we refer to as the grid in here, not to be confused with it's, it's technically flexbox based and not CSS grid based again, for a variety of reasons that I could go deep on, but I don't want to fog it up too much. Um, and so, yeah, this breaks down all the different layouts and column sizes and that kind of stuff. So. I'll take a pause there if anybody has any questions. Um, um, yeah. We we do have some questions that Jeremy's posted in here for us from uh, the YouTube stream. Love it. So Edgar is asking, can I use MAST as a Webflow template designer? Mm, great question. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, Technically, I think still the, the, the standard or the guidelines that Webflow provides for templates, for better or worse, uh, my personal opinion is maybe not the best, but candidly, it was that framework or that those guidelines were made long, long ago. Uh, no, like those guidelines orient that you need to have classes named with all capital or like sentence case and spaces, whereas, you know, mass and many others are using all lowercase and dashes. However, I will say that you could absolutely build the template and then just update the class names throughout everywhere, right? Because of course in Webflow, uh, if I open up a project here, I can go to the classes and I can actually change the name of them right here globally, right? So right. for example, I could just go to this one and say heading one, right? And then that would follow the template guidelines. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, excellent. So another question, this one from Eric. I'd love to hear about using the Reloom library with MAST, especially yeah. in relation to workflow. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, again, I, this is one I could go deep on. I would say the, <laughs> the, the main thing to remember is that, like again, the class naming is all pretty consistent. I should just um, pull up in Reloom library. And, you know, and, and it's... A really, I would say a really great way to approach this would be things like a nav bar or maybe like a tabs component or something like that, where Reloom has done the incredible service of ironing out all the responsive nitty gritty details. And at the end of the day, something like a nav bar, you're going to have custom classes with anyways, especially even in mm -hmm. MAST. So this would be great, like pull the nav bar from Reloom. And then if you're going to go build a simple section that has like text on the left and an image on the right. You can candidly probably build that faster with mass once you're kind of used to it. Then it would take you to come in here and, and find that exact section that matches what you're trying to trying to do, right? So like I'd have to go to feature section and then scroll or filter to find what I want and then copy paste and then update the names and update the styles. Like that whole workflow ends up taking longer in my opinion for something basic like this than just straight up building it directly Right. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of like, I really think they, they can exist together very well. 
Uh, and then again, maybe there's a world where we kind of like start building some more components and actually host them in Reloom um, for y'all. So yeah. All right. Okay. And finally, one last question. Keith would like to know how Corey is so handsome and talented at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're talking about yourself, bro. Like, I don't, I don't know that I fit that mold, but I am honored that you would say that. Uh, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just a nerd hanging out, trying to, trying to make a living with right alongside the rest of y'all, right? So, <laughs> so good. Love it, love it. Cool. Well, Sweet. well, let's yeah, let's take that talent and uh, show you how show us how it works. <laughs> love it, love it. So yeah, again, if you were getting started here, start from the docs, start from the page, go and clone that style guide, um, and then from there, the first thing I usually do is open up the styles page in here. So you'll find there's a home page, which honestly you can just straight up delete, or you could delete the the middle part here because this outer structure is the same structure you use on any page. Um, and then go to your style guide and start bringing in, uh, you know, so you, you'd add the custom fonts if those are a thing in the project settings of Webflow. And then uh, you would start updating the style guide to match the brand of your client, right? Or your in-house team, whoever you're working with, right? So out of the box, you will see there is ironically at the same time, opinions that have been taken here. So we're using a custom font called General Sands. This is a free for all custom fonts. So even if you wanted to start building and just stick with this, that's fine. You can do that. Um, but we also just have it this way instead of using it like in an all unstyled way, just so that it's even quicker. If you do have a really simple thing you want to get going uh, and build, at least there's already opinions that have been applied here. Even things like buttons already have styling for a certain style and hover states and stuff like that. So you could use them right out of the box if you wanted to. Otherwise, you know, this structure here is, is here for you to start modifying. And so maybe a good example of this is I have some other real client site, read-only links open here, um, showing you know what this looks like after those styles have been applied. So this first one here is a freelance project on a team I work with this year uh, that honestly is probably been my favorite project of the year, Wrapbook. Incredible team. They rebranded their site. It was built in Webflow previously. And so, and it's a big site. And so we refactored the entire thing in mass uh, as well as, you know, custom things and whatever. And, and it turned out great. And, uh, their style guide is a great example of not only like things like, oh, we have multiple fonts. So cool. I'll just show all three fonts only, you know, even though there's only one here, you can just duplicate the column. And then now you have another one in this case, you know, we had three. And so I wanted it to be three in a row. And so, you know, the, the irony here is the style guide is all built with the same framework as the rest of the site. So like the layout system is using that same row and column system in the style guide. So you can, you know, use it right there to modify things as needed. Uh, also in here, you can see what I was pointing out earlier, even though mass starts with only four heading sizes. Sure. Go up to six. That's fine. Uh, and I'm just duplicating the same approach here as with just the four, right. And just applying those styles accordingly. If you're not familiar with even why there's, you know, showing both, the difference here is that you know all root all heading sizes are set to a size, and then we always have a class that matches those exact same styles. And the reason for this is if you want something to visually look like a H1, but semantically it needs to be an H2 element in the HTML for accessibility and SEO reasons, then you just apply that class on there to make that happen, right? Um, other things in here you can see is like just other heading sizes that didn't come out of the box. All the colors, again, just duplicating those cards to show all those in here and then using a system to name them accordingly, uh, as well as, you know, text colors, um, buttons. There's a much larger variety of buttons here than you would see out of the box. But again, all you're doing is just taking this root concept and then extending it. And, you know, you can see I'm even doing more things where I have like a combo class if it has an icon or not. Uh, and combining those different ways. And so the other way to also think about the style guide is that this is also the documentation of the site, right? So if you pass along this project to somebody later, they can always come back to the style guide page in here and see all the documented button sizes and classes that are used with them. And so although it's not as formally written out, right? Like there isn't all the rationale in there. Um, you at least have this documentation of what exists for this specific site. And then the thing we love about the written out rationale being independent is that, you know, you can just leave this link in here that links back to the no code supply code site. 
So that way, you know, th whoever picks up the site later can at least come here and find the why and the rationale of things like the layout system. And you aren't the one that has to maintain that, especially like if we find a bug ever since we launched this in January, we found bugs, nothing's perfect. Then we'll always keep this updated. You don't have to worry about that. Right. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the reason even for the separation there. Um, so yeah, this is a great example. Even in here is another section, um, of the style guide called prevent style cleanup. And you can see some actual use cases here. And the, the, the reason this exists is if you have some styles or classes that you built in Webflow, and then you're like using those classes in an embed for various reasons for custom functionality, uh, and you're only using those in the embed, then you need to make sure that you can still always clear your classes like this uh, and not have those accidentally be cleared because they're being used in an embed. And so you, you show them here both as source of documentation, but also making sure they can't be cleared. Um, so yeah, that's something to note there. Um, otherwise, once you get past this point, really, usually most of the utilities things don't change unless you're doing things like adding more, right? So even an example on this site here, if I remember right, is the other section has maybe, yeah, one more. We wanted a margin right 2M for, I forget why, <laughs> honestly, but again, it's fine. We have a 1M on left and right out of the box and we wanted a two. So cool. I'll just duplicate this one, add the class and, and, and note it here, right? So again, I'm going to keep re repeating myself in those ways because really a lot of that is just exponential, you know, even things like helper classes. If you have a specific helper class you want, then go add them here. If I remember right, this project for Ava, this was uh, with the ShapeMaker team um, had, look at, I mean, this one has a ton of text color styles that just match the brand. Here it was. And then this one has a whole section on borders. So this specific brand um, had Ava card is I think what it is. Um, this specific brand had a whole variety of ways it was using borders to define, to, to define styles. And so, uh, we wanted to make sure there was a consistent way to, to note those in here. Right. And so we created a whole section just documenting borders and then, you know, use a similar nomenclature to set those up. So you dash border dash near black or, uh, you dash border dash dark violet. Right. And so I thought this is another great example to show in terms of like, Mass is, again, just the basis. It's not meant to solve everything that could ever hit, come your way out of the sun. It's meant to give you a path to do so, right? Um, yeah, so another great example. This one also has frames. Like, this one goes, yeah, a little deeper. And uh, shout out to all, uh, Ben Selinski, actually, if anybody's familiar with him from the Webflow community. Incredible developer. He actually collaborated with us on this one and built a lot of this out. And I just kind of, you know, guided and helped along the way. Um, yeah, so that's kind of overview of the style guide flag. Any questions you have there in terms of using that? Here was one more. Um, this was for, uh, a, a project I worked on just as the developer only called Monad, uh, that, you know, use type a little differently and some of that. So again, I thought this was a really interesting one just to show, you know, the scalability, flexibility of this, this kind of stuff. Button style is very different here. Um, but you know, it's all still documented and captured in the style guide in the exact same way, no matter what the site's for. Right. Um, yeah. With that, once your style guide is modified, you can start building. Um, and so I'm just going to do it straight with the existing styles in here. Um, and in thinking about what to build, I was even, you know, DMing with Penny a little bit here. Uh, honestly, I was just like scrolling around this morning, trying to find an example. And this was the site I made a web flow that, at least for this root caught, you know, use case of demoing somewhat efficiently. Uh, I thought this was a beautiful layout that still had the simple use case of things like columns and stuff like that had some assets in here. Uh, and so I figured we could kind of walk through building this kind of, this kind of a site uh, directly with maps, right. And pretty efficiently. Right. So again, please stop me along the way. I'll go ahead and just start diving into this. Um, and so one of the first things I would do is, uh, and this is another little hot tip that's maybe not as obvious when you first open mass is, you know, you can see everything is in essentially dark mode, right? Dark background, white text. Uh, and we wanted to make that really easy to update. So there's this element called page wrapper as it's named, you know, it wraps the entire elements of pages on any page. Um, and this actually has the font, uh, and background set on it. So I could just go ahead and switch the font to dark and the background to white. 
And now I have that full approach. I'm sorry if you can hear my, <laughs> my daughter in the background having a hard time. Uh, and, and so, yeah, this, we want a light, light mode. So there it is out of the box. I don't need to go through and apply that at every single section, anything like that. Uh, it's very simple. Another thing I might even do. Is anybody else having a strange audio? Sound? Uh, yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, we lost Yeah. I think we have lost the, the stream. Yeah. Corey, I'm going to refresh. Like, would that do it? Oh, we can hear you now. Okay, okay. That's, yeah. I think my mic just decides to switch sometimes. My, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, jumping back. So I don't know if that part came across. All I was saying is, uh, did you catch the part about light mode, dark mode? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah, it was just the last, the last thirty seconds or so. Love it. So um, in the last, yeah, I think all I was saying is I typically draft the style page um, because usually client or team doesn't want that indexed or public. Uh, you could, mm -hmm. of course, publish it, throw a password on it if it's helpful to share. I've also seen people update the style guide with a little bit more text and language, so it becomes like the brand guide for the client uh and then in which case you know it's used as like a press tool so you know then it would be public but just noting that so once i have that drafted then i'd come in here and we want to start building and so honestly the first thing you would need if we were doing a site like this is the nav and so again this is where maybe reloom is a great option to to to, to grab for if you want a pre-built nav in webflow there's of course all kinds of pre-built things including just like the basic um, nav element that you can find in here. Candidly, like I use shortcuts all the time. So that's the other kind of initial note here is if you don't already in Webflow use Command E or Command K, there is a quick find tool that is incredible. Uh, and with a lot of other shortcuts and something like Mass, you can work very fast with only your keyboard. And so I'm going to try to not do too much of that. But at the same time, I think it is ultimately the thing to strive for. And so the, the TLDR is know that anything I'm doing here, you can also just go to the ad panel and like drag a div in, right? In the same way that I would go command E, div, enter. There's my div, right? And so you can do the same thing in here. You could do nav and have the default nav bar that you could go in and, you know, give it a class of nav uh, and maybe, you know, remove that default ugly gray background. Let's use an actual variable here. You could drop in your logo, add some links. This is fully responsive out of the box, right? Um, so very simple. Maybe for the, is this an image? Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> maybe for the sake of, of example, I will even just drop in this little image, uh, you know, and maybe I'd even give it a class of like nav dash logo, right? Or another maybe arguably better way to name this in terms of BEM and mass would be using uh underscores and dashes so this would be an underscore so nav is the root component underscore means now i'm going to have another kind of sub component right and then on here maybe i would say like i want this to be like 120 pixels wide um and that's good to go from there maybe i would also want to add a class on the brand link that wraps this so it could link to the home page so again i would do nav underscore logo dash link so i'm using a dash here because the link part of it it's all part of the sub component of logo um, the other benefit of doing it this way, and so I don't know what I would do here, maybe like a 20 pixel right margin, something like that, or on hover, maybe I'd want to do, you know, opacity change or something like that. Uh, and so the other point of doing it this way, especially naming, is if you use the FinSuite uh, Chrome extension, if you don't, you should, because it's incredible. And again, shout out to the FinSuite team. Again, I can't state enough. Client first and all that's great. I would never want it to be like, oh, he bashes client first, whatever. FinSuite's great. Uh, and in here, they have a really, really powerful tool uh, in the client first thing called folders. And so what folders does is allows you to bulk rename classes that follow this kind of nomenclature, right? And by using the underscore. So you can see in here, now we have nav as one of the folders. And I can actually expand it and see I have logo and logo link under here. So if I wanted to switch this to you know, nav bar and then hit 
that and save changes and it's going to say, are you effing ready? <laughs> then now that will change that route for me automatically. And so again, this is a great way of just like, you might as well leverage that existing stuff that makes this all the easier, right? And so now you can see nav bar here, and then I'd wanna just, you know, update this to also be consistent with that component thinking of also being nav bar, okay? Other, only other thing I'd maybe do here is this uses the root or the, the default container out of the box. We don't want that. We're gonna just add a div and do a container. And so again, apologies, I'm using shortcuts here. All I did there was command E, type in div, hit enter, and then I do uh, command return or command enter to put my selection in the style selector. And then I'm gonna type container. You can see there's my container. And then now I'm just gonna drag all of these things into here uh, if it's gonna let me. I feel like there's, there's, a, there's a quirk with this. I wanna say this is the way to get around it. Yeah. Go away default container, we don't like you, okay. Um, so from there, boom, now we have our, uh, you know, nav cool. Again, it's responsive. We can adjust that if we want to, we're not going to get into that nitty gritty. So from here, I want to start building some sections, right? I want like a hero section with some text and an image and some of that. And so I'm going to go ahead and add a section. So command E search for section. Again, you could go to the ad panel and, and, and drag in a section. You may ask, well, why use a section versus a div? Um, I mean, honestly, the main reason, especially now is when you add a section by default, it, it assigns it as a section element. So this is great for SEO and accessibility. Uh, somebody with a screen reader, it will read out section, blah, 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 blah. So they know, have orientation of where they are on the page for SEO. Google can understand that this is a section of content that all has related meaning, right? So it's really valuable, um, to do that. So even if you prefer to use divs, make sure you go and make it an actual section when you do that. So since this is a section, I'm going to use our base section class. What this does is adds top and bottom padding by default. Uh, I will get into a little more nitty gritty there in a sec. In that I'm gonna add our div and give it the container class. So right here already you can see reusability coming to life. The point being that if I add some text in here just so we can see what's going on, ooh, my gosh, this just updated actually, I think recently. If, any, if anybody hasn't noted this, before when you added rich text, it was like, this is rich text, blah, 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 blah. Now the boilerplate, the default state of rich text is all the different elements in order. Makes it way faster to style. Quick web flow, team, shout out, plug uh, there. And where I'm getting at though and showing that is you can see that our nav and our content is aligned nicely and it uses the same class. So if I want to adjust the max width, I can do it just on that container and it globally changes everywhere. So you can imagine this across an existing site uh, that has hundreds of pages potentially. And, and the, you know, the client comes to you and is like, oh man, when I make this, this you know, a little narrower, it's just like way too tight here. Can you make that space a little more? And you just say, sure, uh, client, I will just add this, make this one change in the container and boom, the entire site is updated. I don't have to worry about a bunch of separate custom classes or a bunch of separate utilities that are applied in individual use cases, I can globally update something like that. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that every single class that you use in the mass framework is all global like this. There are some like utilities that are intended to be added and removed on a use case basis because that's what we found is most successful, right? So if I go and keep on building while we kind of get into some of this, let's look back at our sample site here. So we have some text on the left and some text on the right. This is where the layout system comes into play. And you can see we have some space here um, above and below. And typically in a layout like this, you know, this looks like a little bit more space up here than down here. We could even, you know, right click and inspect if we really wanted to get nitty gritty um, on this. Candidly, I have not actually looked at the site, so I have no idea how it is built. Um, but yeah, so you can see here, it looks like there's like padding, padding section large. So it does look like uh, the bottom is actually different um then the top so the bottom is nine rem and the, oh the top is nine rem they're the same okay so sweet uh they are the same which out of the box the section right here is the same but it's eight rem so i would just change this to say oh, we want our default to be nine cool and then we have our our container here what i even just did there again sorry i try to prevent myself from like moving too quickly uh is another shortcut to know in webflow is the arrow keys so you can move around so I'm going up and down here to go between parent and children elements. 
Uh, you can also go left and right. So I can go left and right here to go between siblings. So nice to navigate that way. And you can also then combine that with command and move elements in the same way. So we'll get there in a sec, especially with columns. So in our container, now we want to build a layout. So we want to use the layout system. And to do so, we have rows and columns. So if you remember um, way back here in our slide deck, I'm just going to go to it while we're hitting this as a visual reference that, uh, oh, wow, are we, I think we're in a whole separate section now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was probably a different copy of the, uh, of the deck. Here we go. Um, so you can see this example here. We have a row that wraps columns, okay? So we're gonna add a div and we're gonna give it the class of row. And then within that, we're gonna add another div and then we're gonna give it a class of call. And so I'll just add a div within this so we can see, kind of see it visually. But again, all that's happening here, if we look at the navigator, and maybe let's go ahead and pin the navigator so we can kind of see it all happening at once. Um, we have our div, we have our column within it, and now on the column, we can add a variety of combo classes to set how many columns out of 12 we want it to be at each breakpoint. And you don't have to explicitly declare each breakpoint. You can skip them and it will retain that amount of columns down, right? So if, you, if I set, this first column at call LG six. And so you can even see when I type there, Webflow will give me suggestions on those classes that pre-exist. And you can see there's literally one through 12 here. Candidly, I don't know why that's not perfect order, but you know, here nor there. <laughs> and LG meaning desktop. So uh, this is noted in the docs, but desktop is LG, tablet is MD, uh, mobile landscape is SM and then mobile portrait is XS. This is a nomenclature that comes one for one from Bootstrap. Um, so yeah, something to keep in mind there. So I want to say I want this to be six columns, meaning six out of 12, meaning 50%. So a little math there, but it's one of those things, the more you use it, the more you get the hang of it, right? Um, and so I know that within this, I'm going to want a H1, right? Because we have this delightful text here. Everything is architecture. Oof, deep, so deep. Um, and then there, I know that, okay, now I'm going to want some text over here on this side. And so like part of me is like, okay, I could just do command D to duplicate. You could also do command C, command V to copy paste, uh, unless I budge the fingers. Uh, um, or you could rebuild that structure if you wanted to, right? Uh, either way, you just want another column. Now we want a paragraph in there. And again, a quick hot tip is using arrow keys. Uh, and, and you know, if I go left right here on the arrow keys, I can move my selection. But if I'm selected on the right and I do command left key, it will actually move it over, right? So you can really fastly rearrange things, uh, update things, orient things. Uh, you can also move things in and out of children. So anyways, quick note on that. Um, so this doesn't look too bad. Next thing though, I'm like, well, like there's all this space in here and this doesn't really seem like it like matches the design. I need the space. This needs to be jumped over to the right. And so this is where a lot of times, this is another question we get all the time is like, well, the gap between columns by default is essentially 40 pixels because each column has 20 pixels of padding. And then the row outside of it has negative 20 margin. And this is just so that if I was to hover over the container, you can see that this way the column, the content within the column aligns to the edge of the container. Again, this is a bootstrap approach. We just are replicating. Um, and so people are like, well, what if I want that space to be bigger? And this is where you can use the columns to do it, right? And so I could say, instead of this one being uh, six, maybe I want it to be like four. I want it to be a little tighter. And then uh, that's fine. That's closer. But now I need it over here, not butted up against it. And so in the same mindset that we can add a combination of classes on the column, I can go to the row and do the same thing. So I can say row dash, and you can see I have some options here. And so there's a line and justify. And those are the same exact, they're named that way because in Flexbox here, you can see the row is set to display flex. And we have ways we can set alignment and justification on anything with Flexbox. And so in this case, we want to do row justify between so it sets this to be a part, right? And then the other thing I notice here is like, we also want this to be bottom aligned, right? Like it doesn't look right at the top. So again, I can do row dash align. You will notice, uh, and then it's end. 
you'll notice that you don't get the, the suggestions here. And the reason for that is not because something's broken. It's just because Webflow doesn't know the relationship or the, the ability to use this as a global class beyond the first level, but it works, right? And so it's just one of those kind of nuances, maybe arguably like I wish Webflow would, would, would know the possibility of that a little deeper. But the point is that, yeah, it's, it works that way. And it's the same exact thing with the columns, right? Is that once I search beyond here, the only thing I'll see is anything that's already been used as a combination, even if there hasn't been styles applied, which you, sh yeah, you shouldn't do anyways. And so uh, this combination isn't technically a combination in the CSS that's written, but it's you know Webflow's way of recognizing it, right? So um, that kind of brings me to my next point: is like, all right, this is looking pretty good. Um, you know, responsively, I can see things like shift. Um, but now if I go down to tablet, like this is way too tight. I want, you know, you can even see the text is like bleeding out of the column here. And so now I want to adjust this at tablet. So I'll say call dash MD 12. I just want this to be full width now. Um, and then here as well, like maybe this would be 12, but then like that might look like too long, especially like if you think about there's a, there's a rule in design, um, you know, the best practice of like 50 uh, I'm going to butcher the, the rule. I think it's like 50 characters per line length, but it, based on width, I don't know. The point is you don't want too long of lines of text to optimize legibility. So instead, maybe here I would do MD8, right? Um, so that looks pretty good. Feels good when I squish it in and out. Um, and then maybe even down there, that looks still good here. But then here, all right, this is getting a little too tight. So I'm going to tack on an XS12. And note, just like I mentioned before, I skipped SM, right? So if it goes LG, MD, SM, XS, you don't need to declare every one. In fact, I could go all the way from LG to XS. I could leave just LG all the way down if I wanted to, right? And, and the point is that, uh, especially in comparison to grid, CSS Grid or something, my own love of this system is that it's so flexible and I can go any direction on every single column however I want. And it's, it's only about like 60 some classes out of the box that I can reuse almost infinitely, right? Uh, and you can also use columns and rows within columns and rows to get even more granular and wild with some of this, right? You can also do things the opposite direction. So like sometimes people assume columns would only ever need to go down when in fact, like there could be uses for a layout where I'm gonna go, you know, MD on tablet and then actually, for whatever reason, on SM here, I want to go back down to like six, right? So I can go big, small, big, small, small, big, big, whatever, right? Like, so there's a lot of flexibility in the way uh, you can combine these classes and layouts to create something like this. And, and, and I have not created any new custom classes to build this little section, right? Uh, and yet, responsively, it's looking great. Like, maybe there's a little too much extra space here. I might want that to be a little tighter. And then this even brings me into the next marginally contentious point that we often get feedback on is um, headings and text have default bottom margin. A lot of frameworks love to do zero out everything. Uh, a term you may or may not have heard in the web space is normalize. And what that means is like, we're gonna just like clean everything out of the box down to the bare minimum of no styling. And then we will layer on more. And so although we agree with most of that mentality, the thing we love about a default bottom margin on text is that as you're building, you know, other more typical sections, if I was even to duplicate this quick, get rid of my row, go right into my container and add an H2, and then maybe I want a subtitle under it, then out of the box, I don't have to add any utilities, anything like that. Maybe I want a button under this and I'll give it the BTN class all the spacing and stuff is set. I don't have to remember every time I add a title and a subtitle, like, was I using large, extra small? I forget, you know, like, and then because it is globally set, if the client again, later on is like, eh, that feels a little bit too loose. Can you actually change to make this globally tighter? And it's like, sure, I can go to my all H1 and go 0.1 M and I want all those to be tighter. And then in this small use case, I would also want to make sure that the class that matches this size of
is like, uh, oh, can I hover there? Yeah, it's much more close uh, on bottom alignment. And then when I go here, the space is dictated by the column, right? So this is again, one of those things that like, when design translates to development, you as the developer needs to make the call on what's most efficient, maintainable, uh, accurate to the design while ideally flexible for optimizing development. Um, but every project is usually different from one to the other in those kinds of use cases, right? So uh, any other questions so far, Penny? Take a pause. I know we're a little over time, so I, you know, I can also stop, not. <laughs> <laughs> there have been some questions. Um, Akut was asking, these design systems seem to be heavily influenced by Tailwind. Why not use Tailwind directly? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, yeah, I can, I can answer that one briefly. Uh, I mean, you could use Tailwind, sure. Uh, the thing with Tailwind is that it's built to work in traditional development environments where you can have things like compilers or server-side rendering that will only render the classes you need for that page on each page. Whereas if you were to use it in something like Webflow, you have to have that whole massive CSS file out of the box uh, on every page, which like arguably is a lot. Uh, it won't like detriment your page speed, but it will impact it. And then the last part is like using classes and adding or removing them in Webflow isn't as friendly as traditional development in that you can't like reorder them, right? Like I can't like drag and reorder this. Or I can't delete this from this one from the middle. So when you have like to work with. Um, so that's in general the thinking there. Um, some of you might be like, well, this text is way smaller uh, than this. It's like, yeah, it is. Like there, there's things you could do here. Like candidly, if I was building this brand, then this would be my H1 size. And when I was setting up the style guide, I would make sure that this H1 out of the box is that size, right? If, if I was going to be nitpicky here, I could go ahead and use my H2 class on the H1 element. Again, this is important. This is an H1 element. And then that gets me a little closer to that size. So there's something else I wanted to note there. Uh, and then when I'm looking at the layout, the amount of space between the image and, and the, the rows is something else I want to consider. And, and knowing that the amount of space here is the same as up here, um, then that means like I just want this image in this section, right? So very simple. I would just go ahead and upload my image. I could also just drag and drop it into the canvas. But for the sake of uh, simplicity, let's go ahead and um, upload that. And then uh, I could do, you know, go into my container, add an image, um, and then 
uh, checked my image right here. Again, there's many ways you could do this. I could have dra drug it in, that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I might do is just add the UW100 just to make sure that that's always 100% width. You really shouldn't need to do that, but honestly, browsers like Safari sometimes get a little picky when there isn't explicit size set on images, so it's a good fallback. Um, and then now I want to create that space between our row and our image, right? And so there's a variety of ways we could do this. Um, one thing I might do is reach for another utility and do like MT2, uh, or I could do MT3. While we're on this, something you know I kind of breezed over earlier is units and M's being a a, a one that we use for choice in in mast. And so I'll go quickly. I'll try to go quickly on on why that is and and how they work. If you're not familiar with M, so the first thing of what is an M? It is a goofy name for <laughs> a, a unit that is based on the font size of the element it's applied to or its parent that the font size may be cascading down from. In other words, if I was to go back to our heading here, this 0.1m uh, is 0.1 of the font size of this element, since a font size is set on here. You can even click in Webflow, you can click a unit like this, and it will tell you where this size is coming from and saying, oh, the desktop breakpoint, all each one headings have this set. That's why it's showing at this size, right? Uh, whereas font, I could click on font and saying, oh, it's it's orange because it's not directly applied to this element. It's instead being applied to the body all pages at desktop, right? And so 0.1M is of 3.1 rem. If you aren't familiar with rem, it is it stands for relative instead of, I'm, I'm literally drawing the blank on M's direct acronym meaning. Uh, here, no doubt there, but rem is is similar in that it's oriented to the body or the root of the entire page. And so technically rem, it has a much more direct equivalent to pixels and it's usually one rem equals 16 pixels. So honestly, one of the ways I do this all the time is this site, <laughs> I just like it instead of doing the math, I can be like, oh, what is 3.8 rem? That's 60.8 pixels, right? Or really the brand might've come across as 60 pixels is what it needs to be. And so 0.1 of this, if you were to do 0.1, right, then that would be, what, six pixels? Am I, am I wild? Uh, oh, wait, I was, I was just doing the math over here on the 60, all right, 0.1. Yeah, six pixels. So technically, that's what that is, is six pixels, right? Here nor there, you're like, why are you making this so hard for me to set six pixels, Corey? You are a madman. And the reason that we do it is because a, a really common thing, and I'm gonna update the layout just to make the point here, right? A really common thing that we'll see in web design is um, you need to adjust sizing and spacing as you go down in breakpoints, right? You of course don't want, if, if I was to set, I'm just gonna make up a utility here, right? So if I was gonna do U MB 100, and we would say that this is 100 pixels, then that means, or rem, if, if you had the rem equivalent. That means now I need another modifier to change this here and here and here because this space, like, it's just too much. It would naturally need to get smaller because it visually looks different here than here. And so what M does is we already know the font size of an H1 or anything needs to go down, right? It can't stay massive on mobile because it just wouldn't work. There wouldn't be enough space for you, it's, you to read it, right? And so M's allow you to latch on piggyback, hijack, whatever term you want to use to explain that to that size change. So if I do MB1, oops, uh, the actual MB1, UMB1, on an H1 as well as an H3, you can see that although both are set to 1M, the amount of space is based on the font size. And since that font size is going down, the amount of space will go down and I only have one utility. I don't need to add four different utilities in combination that ah. I then need to remember as I go down, right? And so again, a lot of times people are like, you know, there is the, the, this is why we call it developer first, right? As a framework is that this is developer thinking, honestly, like there is math involved here. There's strategy involved here. This is not just like very rudimentary. And so the way we do it and the reason we do it is for efficiency. And, you know, th then, but to make it efficient, we're, we're leveraging native units of the web as they're intended to be leveraged. Like somebody somewhere at some time thought of the reason and the why of M 
and it was this, right? And so we just want to we just want to embrace that. Again, I, I I don't I try to not like go down the webflow pre train too often. I mean, I do all the time. Let's be honest. But like this is why, and this is a great example why webflow versus many other tools. So many other tools just abstract this away and they just you just set a size arbitrarily on every single individual use case you know versus leveraging all of this like ingenious functionality that exists in the browser webflow didn't invent this it's just letting you use it right and so hopefully that gets the point across on m and you know if i if i back out here to kind of the layout we had and go back to oops and go back to what we were originally solving for in this use case is now, since there is no font size set on an image, M is just equivalent to the base, which is the body, right? And that is one M, which is, which is equivalent to 16 pixels. If I go back to our little handy converter here and do one M, it's 16 pixels. So a three M on this would be 16 times three, uh, which is 48, <laughs> 32, <laughs> 48, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that would be the equivalent size, right? And then going down, since there is no font size change, that size, that amount of space will stay the same all the way down, right? Another thing, if the layout was a little different here, another thing I do just for the sake of, of example is reuse the section. So here's another little handy shortcut in Webflow. You can do command option G to wrap any element in a div. And, and then I could give that div that I wrapped a section class. So I can make sure that the spacing here is exactly the same as here. And that section class actually does get smaller as you go down for the same reason a heading gets smaller. You don't want it to be massive the whole time. Like the layout needs mm -hmm. to feel consistent, right? Um, yep. But then in this, this use case, if I go ahead and give this section so we can see what's going on, I'm going to give it a background utility. Another beautiful use case of utilities, right? Is I can add, remove them as I need. But now this is way too much space. So yet again, I'll use another pre-existing utility. And this time, instead of MB, meaning margin bottom, I'm going to use PB, which means padding bottom. And I'm going to use it not to add something, but I'm going to use it to remove something. I don't want this bottom padding here. I only want the top. So I'm going to do UPB0. That gets rid of that top. And then now I have this top, uh, or sorry, that gets rid of the bottom padding, but I retain the top. So that way that can match that all the way down. Um, so hopefully that is a good example of like the way that these classes aren't single use case dependent. They are intended to be used in variety and creative ways that is reusability to the core, right? Like it, I don't have to have like section CC padding zero or something like that. Like it, it, I'm reusing what's there for most use cases. The thing we always say is this is also 80-20, right? Like it's not gonna solve for everything. It'll hopefully get you 80% of the way there, um, right? But it's not always going to be perfect. Um, so there's absolutely just like the nav, there's always going to be use cases where you want something to be very, very, very specific. If I was to even go really quickly on that point alone, an example of that might be this, where it's like, no, like the client really wants this to exactly break at this size when we're at full desktop. And, you know, so using the layout system, if I was to preview, maybe it's not breaking there. Let's even, let's even just like copy this text, uh, so we can make the point more clearly. Um, and so in that case, maybe instead I would do um, uh, like LG6 and then MD12. And then I would go on to this paragraph. And again, I'd probably use a wrapper here instead of doing it on it directly so that I can leave this MD0. So I add a wrapper, command option G, give that a class. I'd be like home hero. That's our kind of root use case, underscore uh, subtitle something like that, right? Don't trip too much about it being perfect. Um, and then I would say, I want this to have like a very explicit max width of like, I don't know where to start. Ooh, that's way too small. Um, something very explicit right there. Like, look at that, that's a nice kind of flow. And then uh, I'm gonna use margin left auto to bump it that way, right? And now I have a custom class so I can get really granular. I want my design to be like really, really, really specific to the text and the content and the layout. And so I'm gonna just use a custom class and that's totally okay. But the point is that I'm using it on that small 20%, not everything like other you know, tools, or even if you're just building from scratch, sometimes people just build everything from, all the classes are component and use case dependent. And it's just really not doing yourself a service of reusability, right? And then maybe if I get down here, then I could go ahead and modify that, right? 
here's something else to, to consider when using uh, classes is if I didn't do this wrapper, if I just added this class directly to this paragraph um, and I still wanna get rid of this bottom margin, then this is fine as well. But here's what I would not do is I would not do this. Uh, I would not combine a utility with a custom class. Uh, and the reason being is what always ends up happening on accident is somebody would then come here and actually let me let me go back here. Add that I'm going to unset this auto, right? Uh, and then I'd add the MB0 to get rid of it. And then I'd be like, oh, wait, I need the auto on here too. And then I come back down here and modify this, go back to zero. Fine. But the issue is now the only reason that auto exists is when these are used in combination. So what if somebody else comes along later, remembers you had this custom class and they add only that, but then they're like, why is it broken? Like, why isn't it off to the side? You know, like, and cause it's not very obvious that you would need this combination. So instead the thing we, we say to do is just apply, you know, of course this one directly, but if you need, need to get rid of this bottom margin, just do it right on the custom class. Don't add a utility as well, because this just gives, you're already adding a custom class for the sake of granular control. So you can do the granular control on the simple stuff here too as well. So hopefully that makes sense um, and kind of helps with that nuance of when to use custom classes versus base classes versus utility classes. You know, we go into detail a little bit more on this right here when we talk about class types uh, and class management as well, right? Don't combine too many utilities, that kind of thing. That one's hopefully pretty clear, um, but like a good example of that one is like, instead of building a card, you know, like somebody might be like, I want a card. And so I'm going to do like P1 and BG black and text white and margin one, like, and then drop some text in here. Like don't, instead of doing it this way, where it's like, you're combining all these very explicit things. Instead, you could just have card, right. Or, or just a, it, it's a, it's a use case specific thing. Uh, and so don't force utilities when you don't need to, they're really meant for this use case of like I've been showing where we want to tack on a margin, remove a padding, uh, set a width, right? They're, they're the, the, the little sprinkle, the garnish on top of your meal. They're not intended to combine to make full meals, which like arguably is exactly what Tailwind is, right? Somebody asked about right. Tailwind earlier and it is, it, it's intended to, you make meals out of everything and that's <laughs> fine that's fine especially and i would agree if i was building raw code react apps i'd probably use tailwind too but in webflow i just don't think it's the right approach um right so that was amazing and and i think everybody has gotten so much out of that but i think we're probably at time at this yeah. point and i think we could probably have you come back and just do just you know kind of looking at class time, you know, things, you know, just yeah. sort of looking at how to, you know, dig more into actual class uh, situations where you Yeah, know, and that, so. totally. And I hope at least even seeing this site, you know, you can start to see just from building mm -hmm. the one section, you can get the idea of like, oh, yeah, this is a row and a container or a column set to the right, right? These are row and col like, so yeah, 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 totally makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that was that was great. Thank you very, very much. I think we're all uh, ready to start digging into MAST a little bit more and, and figuring it out and, uh, and then hopefully sharing some of our work online. So thank you, Corey. And uh, so everybody who's here and watching on YouTube, we are planning to do more uh, a variety of different workshops coming up over the next few months. So keep an eye out. If you're not already on our mailing list, go to nocodenorth.com and sign up on our mailing list and uh, follow us on Twitter at x.com slash no code north and okay. follow our YouTube channel. And anything else, Corey, before we say goodbye? Yeah, I just plus one and thank you so much for having me. Uh, Y'all the best, one of my fave communities in the community. And uh, if, if anybody listening has questions, please hit me up. Uh, you know, you can message me on CoreyMowen.com. If you're on Twitter, I'm at Corey G. Moen. You can DM me there. Um, yeah, I, I'm always eager to hear use cases, successes, failures, frustrations, whatever it is. Nothing is done alone. And so we, we are absolutely always craving that feedback. So please let us know. 
Uh, and yeah, as you already alluded at the beginning, if you are also getting in the no code space, check out no codes, uh, no code supply.co, uh, where we're adding resources, inspiration, code snippets, videos, articles, tutorials every single day. Um, and we have a lot more exciting stuff coming like merch newsletter, that kind of stuff. So, so keep an eye there. Excellent. Cool. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, next week, we're just having a hangout. So if you're new to No Code North or visiting us, come and hang out with us next week on Friday at 12 Eastern. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Love it. Bye.